happening here on Monday, the second week of the COP15 Global Climate Summit? Well, negotiations here have been put on hold for now while uh, while they, the, the Danish presidency here tries to figure out a path forward. They, they don't appear to actually have begun this morning. Uh, delegates from African nations are, are protesting um, along with other uh, countries from the developing world, uh, arguing that there needs to be a binding agreement out of this. And they're protesting the fact that some of the developed nations they feel are trying to, to diverge from the Kyoto Protocols, which have been established uh, since 1997 and have already put people on a path to binding emissions targets uh, so they're encouraging they're encouraging those countries to stick to that path uh, and and trying to fight back against efforts that they, they see as trying to undermine uh, the work that's already been done on this issue and so negotiations have been put on hold for now and the uh, Ivo de Boer who's the uh, executive secretary of the UNFCCC uh, says that the the Danish president's uh, president's RC is having meetings with all the different countries today um, to try to figure out what the path forward needs to look like um, and what kind of issues need to be resolved before they can actually resume uh, concrete talks here this week. Was this suspension by the G77 block of African and, and poorer countries, was this expected? Is this a surprise? And w what does it mean? Contextualize it. Well, tensions have been pretty high here uh, for the last few days of negotiations, uh, largely due to protests from the G77 bloc and also the alliance of small island states um, who have, have also raised concerns that they really want to see a binding legal treaty uh, come out of this summit. Um, it's been ongoing issues. They're concerned that the talks are not going to yield a legally binding commitment. They're concerned that the uh, suggested limit on temperature rise of two degrees is, is not enough to protect them from the worst impacts of climate change. And they're also so concerned that they're not going to be getting enough money uh, short term and long term to help finance both adaptation and mitigation here. So these are concerns that have been raised repeatedly and there there were a few there's several different walkouts last week and there have been several uh, high intensity press conferences here with these nations who are who are raising those concerns. Um, and so today's uh, the, the stall is not entirely unexpected but uh, it, it, it seems like it will be there's a lot of important issues that need to be worked out before uh, before heads of state come here at the end of the week and, and ideally are they're coming to work out a final deal. Clarify Kyoto for us for a second and, and why the Kyoto is so important to the G seven seven and and yet why the United States for one is resisting some of the Kyoto um, establishments. Well, the Kyoto Protocol was put in place in 1997, and it was intended to hold developed countries to binding emissions targets. Uh, of course, the United States never signed on to the Kyoto Protocol, um, and we have not been legally bound by that um, at any point so far, while a number of other developed nations uh, were, they were bound. But the Kyoto Protocol did not hold the developing nations, especially the major developing nations like China and India, um, Brazil, Indonesia, these these countries that have emerged as major forces since 1997 weren't included in those protocols. And the United States has held firm that they would like to see a new binding deal that includes those countries. Um, while while they don't necessarily want to see the same cuts that they're seeing coming from the developed world, they want to see at least some level of commitment to begin reducing emissions. Um, U.S. Uh, Chief Negotiator Todd Stern has said repeatedly that the, the bulk of the world's emissions in the future, uh, about 97%, are going to come from these rapidly developing countries, and it would, it it would not necessarily uh, be in the, the best interest to not have them included in some meaningful way. But, uh, of course, the, the, the smaller countries, those who are, are going to be the most impacted and, and do not have the, the financial resources to deal with it, um, they want to they wanna, they wanna continue with the Kyoto Protocol as it is in place right now, um, in addition to having other uh, other has worked out with the U.S. and countries who are not part of Kyoto. When, when we talk about the G77 bloc, um, I mean, who are some of the faces behind that that we've heard from and seen from and been reading about um, here the first week of COP15? Well, the G77, which is actually not all that accurate, there's more than 130 nations in the G77 now, um, are the representative of the of the, the both the poorest countries in the world. Uh, you see a, a lot of African nations, um, a lot of uh, Latin American nations. They're all in, involved in the, in this block, um, and uh, they've become really kind of a, an important visible force here. Lamumba de Ping, who is the head of the Sudanese delegation, and he's also the the, the chair of the G77 bloc, has been very vocal and has been. Um, has been is very firm here that he wants to see uh, a binding commitment for developed nations, but also um, 
a, a large amount of compensation to the countries who are going to be most impacted by climate change. The other really strong group here this and last week has been the alliance of small island states. Now these are these are very tiny countries. They don't have a lot of political sway, and there you know there actually aren't that many of them. But they're going to be the countries that feel these impacts first. So they've also been holding holding very firm that they want to see. Uh, not only uh, binding commitments here, but, but more aggressive commitments than have been offered on the table. So the uh, Tuvalu and the Maldives and Cape Verde, these have been countries that you don't often hear about, but they've been very visible here in, in raising concerns about the impacts of climate change. And, and not, that is not just a, a political calculation for them, but it's really an, an ex existential crisis that they're facing. You mentioned Lumumba, the key negotiator for from Sudan or, or for Sudan. Um, we, we were ha supposed to, to have an, to tape an interview at 1 p.m. with Naomi Klein. She was going to interview him. That was canceled because of this all being thrown up in the air, and presumably he's very busy right now. But he's, didn't he stage a kind of an emotional event last week where he uttered some quotes that then have been repeated by activists and, and demonstrations? Last week after there was a, 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 a leaked pre-draft, if you will, uh, of what a final deal might look like here, which was was not nearly as strong, uh, did not have as nearly strong targets for developed nations and um, did not have nearly as strong uh, goals for limiting emissions and limiting temperature rise. Uh, after that draft was leaked out, the, uh, the G77 and the African bloc in particular staged a, a, a spur of the moment protest in which Dia Ping made a, a very passionate uh, declaration of, of what they'd like to see here. Uh, there are several lines that have been repeated very often here. One, that, that, that the small amount of funding for climate finance is not enough to buy people in Africa coffins. Um, and also that signing onto a deal like this would be essentially a suicide pact for African nations. So those have been lines that have, have gotten a lot of attention here. Uh, I spoke to him shortly after the protest as well, and he outlined some of the really specific things that they would like to see in a final deal uh, before members of those countries will, will be willing to sign on. They're not willing to sign on to something that they feel will, will disadvantage their countries and, and, and not help their populations. I think he also said, we will not die quietly. And I, I've seen that on I've seen that on, on on activists and protesters' signs both inside the Bella Center and outside during the big march on Saturday. Since then, you spoke to him right after uh, his emotional plea. Did did um, did his kind of I mean he there were some tears involved. Did it did it seem spontaneous or calculated to you? Um, I, I wasn't actually present for the for the protest itself. I caught up with him uh, shortly later. Um, I, I, it, it was very. It was. It, it appeared very passionate from what I have seen in the in the in the news on it. I, and, and it's very clear, speaking to him, that he that this is very important. And he, and he really does care about this. And that, that negotiators from the G77 bloc are not are just not willing to put their people uh, at risk by saying something they don't feel is is strong enough. Um, I think there's been also a, a lot more media attention given to the G77 bloc than they've ever had before. So I think there's probably a lot of pressure to uh, to to say to say things that are quotable and dramatic. Uh, so there's probably a certain part part of that playing in here as well. But uh, I think I think they're very serious about wanting to hear, have their voices heard here. Um, are there any other kind of heroes that are, that are emerging, speaking out on behalf of the? Uh the countries that are most adversely affected by global climate change? I mean, you mentioned the Pacific Island nations as well. Tuvalu staged a walkout earlier this week, and, and they're, they're one of the nations that's on the front lines of climate change. Uh, they're already uh, facing sea level rise, and has number, they have a number of people who've already have moved to New Zealand uh, to, to try to to relocate away from some things that are happening there back home. Uh, the Maldives is another example. Uh, they've been a lot in the, news, in the news a lot recently for holding cabinet meetings underwater uh, as a statement um, uh, of what, what is to come for them without, without real action. So they've also been getting a lot of attention here too. Um, and as well as other countries that you don't often hear about. The chair of the Alliance of Small Island States uh, is from Grenada. Her name is Destin Williams. She's also been a very visible, um, eloquent speaker about the, the, the challenges that they face uh, back home. If, if, if there really is a walkout and negotiations are suspended, any idea how that might impact the, the travel plans of, of Obama and all the heads of state who are still planning on coming here later this week? I think I think that the the secretariat um, Ivo de Boer, uh, as well as the the Danish leaders Connie Hedegaard is the is the is serving as the president here of, of COP15. I think they are still at this point optimistic that they can have these meetings today and figure out uh, the best path forward. 
uh, so that they, things can continue on track so that when world leaders get here at the end of the week, there are, are actual concrete decisions to be made and a final uh, sort of, some manner of deal can be sealed here. I think they're still optimistic at this point. And I think the really important thing to remember is that uh, while this attention has a lot of media coverage, there's a lot of NGO observers here, there's a lot of attention put on this, uh, these, these kind of like small flare-ups and, and kind of fits and bursts of progress are, are, are pretty normal. Um, and I think that, you know, it's all, it's all part of the process and what ha what's really important is what happens at the end. So while this is important and dramatic, it's not necessarily the, the huge red alert. Right, that, they, that, that they're, there still needs to be more focus on, I guess, the, the, the final outcome, not, not the kind of dramatic flare-ups that we're all, we're all seeing here. Thank you so much. Off your next interview.